I've got a guest on the show who I think many of you will find very enlightening. Um, it's Professor uh, Liang Yan or Yen Liang, depending on whether we go with the English or the Chinese approach. And she is a professor of economics at Willamette University in the United States. Uh, professor Liang has recently written an essay in the TI Observer, which is the monthly magazine of the Taiha Institute, a think tank in Beijing, explaining the the nature and the significance of this concept of new quality productive forces and its role within the way that Chinese public policymakers think about the economy, its policy directions and its priorities. What I'm hoping we can do today is pick her brains on what all of this means and why it matters for understanding what's going on in China now and into the future. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Huawei, for the invitation. Um, very happy to be here. Um, Great. So, mm -hmm. let, 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 let me just ask you directly then. Um, uh, this, this, this issue of uh, new quality productive forces, what is it and why is it important? Yeah. So I think this is a um, pretty standard concept in terms of the so-called productive force, right? So this is sort of a from a Marxian uh, economics sort of schools of thought that what drives society, what drives the economy um, is mostly the foundation of your productive force, which is how you utilize technological know-how, um, how to, uh, you know, improve your mastery of, of nature over nature. Um, so it's more on the productive side. And then you have the superstructure that has to do with your productive, your, your production relationships, right? So how you, uh, for example, after your production, you how you distribute and how you maintain the kind of social relationships uh, within that uh, production cycle. So I think the way that we think about the so-called new quality productive force, and just for short, let's say the force, um, I think we need to first think of this in a more historical perspective. So why this is a time that we need to talk about a new force, right? So as we know, in the past 40 years, China really has transformed itself. But in the recent years, uh, we have seen some shift, some very significant pivot. And I think, you know, it was about 2017, uh, in the 19s, uh, the people, the, the sorry, the, the Congress of the um, Communist Party uh, of China, that's when Xi Jinping brought up this concept of the new quality uh, development, right? So what does that mean? Uh, what is the so-called new quality development? So I think this is a pivot away from the previous sort of high growth uh, model that China has, you know, developed in the past 40 years. And that's what has propelled its growth, right? In the 40 years, China has accomplished a lot um, since 1980s, right? That um, there was a reform, there was an opening, there was, you know, a lot of productive forces that are being developed that rely on a lot of investments, a lot of, you know, export processing product productions in the 90s. Um, then you have 20s, you see a lot of developments in the, for example, consumer internet, um, you see the real estate investments, um, and you also see a lot of um, relatively low value added manufacturing. So all those have propelled China's growth and lifted, you know, 800 million uh, people out of poverty, more or less, um, by 2020. Um, so you see this very transformative growth in China, but that model has its own limitation. And so when you look at a historical evolutionary point of view, there are some limitations such as, you know, these are very resources intensive. They do provide, um, you know, high growth, but they also have tremendous environmental implications as as uh, as well as some distributive implications that we can you know go more into detail if we want to um but basically what you're seeing is that you know since the global financial crisis um china's growth slows down and also the so-called total factor productivity growth which is a way to measure um you know sort of your growth that is not driven by extensive resources input um, that has slowed down and that only, you know, when you look at the post global financial crisis, the TFP's contribution to GDP, is about 0.5 percentage points, which is much lower than the previous uh, about two percentage points. So in other words, this is time um, for changes, right? So that's the new quality development concept. In other words, we want to grow not for the high speed, but now we want to grow in a more efficient way. 
more equitable way and also more um, sustainable way. So I think that efficiency uh, propelled by technological innovations, productivity growth, more equity, equitable uh, growth, right? Which means that, you know, when workers um, contribute their skills and talent, they're going to get a bigger income share um, and also more sustainable, right? With less environmental uh, toll on the economic growth. So that concept was, you know, brought up in 2017 and it became codified and it became a reality. But the question still remains, um, what, what are the tools for us to achieve that high quality development? So I think it was about, um, you know, the end of last year or 20, wait, we're 2024. Um, so it was um, recently that Xi Jinping, when he was expecting uh, it, inspecting um, in the Heilongjiang province uh, in some of the production site, that's when he started to brought up this uh, concept of the so-called new quality productive force. So to me, um, as he mentioned, right, in his own words, this is endogenous uh, element to that new quality development, right? The endogenous means that this is basically called for by the system itself, by the economic system itself. It's not imposed um, outside of the system. So it's an endogenous response to the need of the economic system, but it's also a necessary ingredient. It's a tool, it's, a, it's an indispensable um, tool, right? To allow China to embark on that high quality development. So to me, this concept embraces three dimensions. It, it involves a really systematic evolution of the technologies, of the processes, but also the relationships uh, within you know, the productive circle. Um, so these three dimensions to me, one is uh, we need to develop new technologies. We need to develop the so-called strategic emerging industries that are mostly high-tech and propelled by technological innovations. And second is that we need to integrate all these high-tech into the traditional sectors. So China still has a wide range of industries. Um, so promoting high quality development doesn't mean we need to exit these traditional industries. But what it means is we need to upgrade these industries to make them smarter and greener, right, and better. Um, and then I think the last dimension is we also need to build certain market institutions, public institutions, uh, we need to reform some of the soft infrastructure um, to enable this kind of uh, technological innovations and adoption of these technological mm -hmm. innovations. Um, so, to, so sort of is the more on the software side of that productive force. So let me let me start with this. Great. Look, there's a lot to unpack there, and perhaps what I might do is um, is ask you to just, in a sense, describe the, the this issue of the total factor pr productivity. Um, decline in the 2010s. It seems to me um, that this has something to do actually with the tremendous growth that was achieved um, post-global financial crisis in the property sector. And the property sector is actually a very low productivity activity. Um, would that be a good starting point to think about the transition that's taking place where the 2010s was very dominated by property, particularly the real estate sector, and now we're needing to move out of that um, into other dimensions of economic development. Right. I think I agree with this, even though I think, you know, it's still debatable. Um, when you build real estate, uh, one thing is that it does have a very long gestation period. Um, and it's also a fixed asset that really have very life, very long life uh, duration. Yeah. So there is the argument that, you know, this kinds of, uh, you know, sort of the, the cash flows or the profits, right, or efficiency that will be generated from these um, real estate, you know, projects or even infrastructure projects are going to be low at the upfront and they will yeah. remain to be low for an extended period of time, but they will be stable and they will continue to generate cash flows and go much beyond than, you know, the general sort of machinery and tools. Um, so I think in a way, it is true, the decline in TFP, and by the way, this is not a China phenomenon. I think there's also global uh, dimension to that. And that has to do with maybe slow globaliz uh, globalization that could be, you know, has something to do with the reshuffling of supply chain that we could talk about. Uh, but in general, I agree with you. I think a lot more emphasis was put on real estate development and infrastructure development. And a lot of times, again, they don't necessarily make positive economic um, uh, benefits 
at least not in the short term. And also sometimes it's simply just, you know, when you build high speed rail and you control the, the, the tickets price, right? Then you may never become really very proud of profitable directly for that specific project. But it doesn't yeah. mean it's not productive. So I think there is a very important distinction between profitable, right, in the sense of, you know, very straight jacket measure of, you know, return on investment, return on equity, and so on and so forth. Um, but there is also the economic benefits that sometimes cannot be captured by simply looking at the profits. But nonetheless, um, I agree, I think, you know, uh, one of the, I think, problems, I would say, with the real asset development is one is it's become highly speculative. So if you're really building houses for people to lift in, I think that's great. Um, that adds a lot of social values, that adds a lot of economic values, even though you cannot capture it directly, as I just mentioned. But when a lot of the housing units or real estate projects become speculative, Right, talking about financialization of housing um, that is really prevalent in the Western countries, especially in the United States where I live, um, you know, that can become a problem. So I do think that it's important to know um, that there are some limitations when the housing market becomes speculative. But also, I think given China's own uh, structural transformation, right, there is the decline in population. Um, there is the slow down in urbanization. Um, there's also, you know, some of these houses are really um, white elephant projects by certain local governments that are built but not occupied. Um, so I think with all these structural limitations um, with the housing market, I think it makes sense to to pivot away from it. And which is, I think, what China has been doing since 2020, right? As you well all know, uh, with the, you know, three red lines policy, then we start to see this pivot. And it seems that there's an interesting um, couple of points in all of that. One is that the investment in infrastructure and housing, which has dominated the 2010, is likely to actually have a very long tail effect. So its short term impact productivity wise is actually relatively modest, relatively speaking, but its impact productivity wise in terms of the total social capital is actually quite significant. That's the first thing that I take out of your observations there. And the second thing is is that, um, and perhaps this is something that you could um, give some thought to, uh, is that as we move into this um, next phase, if you will, with explicitly productivity-focused technology development or new productive forces, the forces, um, it, it's likely, in fact, or it's, it's distinctly possible that the next so many years we'll actually see a very significant productivity uptick quite contrary to the mainstream views of the short and medium term trajectory of the Chinese economy. Thoughts? Yeah, I think in a way, um, so I, I, I would say two things. One is that, um, as we just mentioned, you know, a lot, a lot of these, uh, you know, social capital, they don't generate maybe short term surge in productivity growth. But yes, they will take time to you know, to continue to generate that positive return. And second is, I, I do think that, you know, this is uh, some economists, for example, Yu Kong Wang has mentioned, has talked about this in his book about debunking, you know, China um, China's economy. And he actually talked about um, when you have large resources that are devoted to innovations, R&Ds, basic research and things of those nature. Uh, and again, typically what you will see is the, productivity slow down in the in the short period. Um, he used the example of South Korea and um, some other countries as well, um, simply because, again, it takes time for these technologies to come to fruition. And also it takes time for these technologies to be integrated. So um, it, it sometimes it would just simply, uh, it, it will not be manifested right away. And so that positive return is going to pan out, you know, over a relatively long period of time. And and also, you know, maybe there's an uptick, uh, like you said, right, that you see the surge in the productivity growth, and then you will continue with a high trend. But it could also be, you know, the kind of productive forces are going to be unleashed in a more stable way. And so I think that remains to be seen. But what we have seen, I think, you know, borne out by the recent experience of China's growth is we see this a lot of investments in the green tech, um, and also in, you know, um, the digital act. Uh, digital tech, right? 
they're really helping to boost technology, uh, b- sorry, boost te- uh, productivity and also boost GDP growth. And those are, you know, more than offset uh, the real estate's drag. So when we look at, for example, 2022's data, um, the housing sector has been shrinking and its uh, contributed, c- contribution to GDP growth was a negative 3.7 percentage points. But with the green economy and the digital economy, uh, we've seen a expansion in those sectors and that contributed to, you know, 4.7 percent points to GDP. So I think what that means is that, you know, as we uh, gradually unwind the traditional sector, we will see, you know, this productivity to continue to grow. But whether or not that will be a surge, um, I'm not sure about, you know, how that would pan out because we're not talking about a technological revolution. And I think if we're talking about revolution, sometimes that could be tricky, right? Because we see this again, again, the IT bubbles, the IT bubbles, you know, the, the almost the AI bubbles, I would say. Um, so I think if we are able to generate the kinds of evolution that help us to get onto a more stable, but high level uh, base, I think that would be desirable. Um, but we are seeing, you know, all these transformations in China's economy, right? It's not just the, like, some people would say it's just green shoots. In some of the sectors, the government protect or support and you see the growth. And then other sectors were simply, you know, no way for them to 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 grow or thrive, right? And we hear a lot of Western media talked about it, like, you know, back in 2010, even there was a doubt about China's EV sector. Is it worth the investment? You know, China can't pull it off, cannot pull it off, right? And now it's a similar story about semiconductor or AI. Um, mm-hmm. But I think gradually we're seeing this kind of long-term strategic patient capital investment will generate, you know, um, you know, w- will bear fruit. Um, so I think that is, it's, uh, I personally, I would prefer that to be a stable and, and sort of a, a progressive, continuous, you know, transformation as opposed to be a, you know, a, a sort of a, a major breakthrough and that all of a sudden we see a surge, but then, you know, what would be the next, uh, you know, next phase? Yeah, you 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 touched on EVs, and I think EVs is a very interesting case in point because EVs is an intersection of productivity enhancing automation on the one hand, plus it's part and parcel of this renewable energy or green transition as well. I've seen videos and reports of the productivity levels being achieved in some of these new EV plants uh, with um, with one of the recent ones um, from. Shouldn't mention any particular names, but they're achieving something like 76 new units per minute coming out of a fully automated plant. Now, um, it, would, would that be a, a classic example, I guess, of new productive forces at work, number one? Um, but perhaps in answering that, you may give also some uh, consideration to the distributional questions, because I think that's one of the key points here is, uh, is the extent to which labour actually gets to keep um, a larger portion of the value add that, that, sh- that is achieved through value adding. Yeah, absolutely. So I think what you mentioned was uh, Xiaomi, right? The newest yes, engines it. of the market and their SU7 model. Um, they're able to turn out every car in 76 seconds. And also they sold out in the first 24 hours for their 2024 um, so production quota. So that is very impressive. And it's also, uh, it, it, you know, it's remarkable. And we can definitely... You know, I know that you have done a lot of work on debunking this idea of overcapacity. So maybe uh, we could have some discussions on that in terms of, you know, all these myths, right, about over over um, capacity. But I think that it's a, you know, that's a brilliant example where you have a product that is high tech and it's also green tech and green product, right? And it's so significant in many different levels. But then the production process itself is also highly automated. And so that really, um, you know, using high tech to produce, you know, high tech and green tech. I think that is a very, uh, you know, virtuous cycle, so to speak. I think that you see the increase in productivity in so many dimensions and levels. So for one, the production process itself, it's highly, you know, productive, right? Highly, you know, technological and uh, product uh, and productivity enhancing. And the kinds of products that you produce, um, it's also, you know, represent this new generation of technologies and efficiency. Um, and also, you know, environmentally, um, you know, sustainable. And so that I think is what, you know, when Xi Jinping talk about this endogenous, I think that's exactly what it means is that the system calls for new products, 
right, that people are no longer satisfied with driving, you know, ICEs uh, in China. So we're seeing people are adopting more and more the EVs, right? It simply works well for them, um, you know, with, with the energy saving, also with the, the convenience of public charging stations and um, it just makes sense. And also a lot of uh, very smart, intelligent features in those in those new generation cars. Um, you know, you see this in the new um, auto show in Beijing. Uh, it just, you know, happened recently. And you see so many different concept cars that really tailor and com- uh, and sort of customize um, for the consumer's preferences. So that is an endogenous process in the sense that, you know, people's living standards now is, is much higher. Um, they they ask for, they demand for different types of products um, that need to be made. And that requires higher productivity, higher level of technologies uh, to be able to make those products. And so I think this, this is a fantastic example, um, you know, why there's so much potential and it's, you know, in China's EV, uh, both production, but also in terms of its demand. And that's exactly what's happening in front of us. Yeah. I'll put, I'll put you on the spot a little bit here, and it's mainly because I don't know the answer either, and maybe you don't, but hopefully you do. The The adoption of automation and various ranges of new technology production processes is often seen as a threat to employment. Um, the traditional car manufacturing facility was full of workers on a production line, and the, uh, and, and the modern factories that we're seeing the videos of and the photographs of from the Chinese EV sector is actually almost person-free. And I guess uh, I'm curious as to the the nature of the impact on employment. One is, is that it seems that there is a very significant impact on the research and development side of things, plus the range of um, uh, testing engineers and that sort of stuff. But in aggregate terms, uh, how do you see the employment impacts of this move down the new productive forces, number one, and how do you think that will impact on the aggregate level of um, take-home pay in, in, in the Chinese economy generally? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think I did leave out when you asked about the distributive effects um, from this new productive force, but I think you're right. I mean, this is very, very important, and I know that there are a lot of critiques, um, you know, when it comes to China's economy, right? When you have this high productivity growth and immediately the question is, you know, what about unemployment? What about all these youth, um, you know, um, college graduates who can get jobs and things like that? Uh, Because automation is going to replace a lot of, you know, uh, manufacturing workers and so on and so forth. So the way I think um, I I see this, um, for one is like you said, there are some sectoral changes in where we'll find jobs. And so one is really those brain jobs where, um, you know, you, you stay, still cannot be simply replaced by, uh, you know, routine types of um, uh, robotics, right, to, 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 to take place. So you're, you're right about, you know, scientists, engineers, R&D, researchers, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but at the same time, I think also in terms of the service sector, that it's also going to generate a lot of jobs down the road. And all this discussion also needs to be uh, put in the perspective of, you know, where we have demographic changes, right? That now we're talking about, you know, China is going to have a shrinking population, shrinking labor force. So I think sometimes we should not overstate, you know, this sort of potential uh, unemployment pressure just because we are seeing a smaller labor pool. Um, and so... The way I would see it for one is I still think that um, the service sector is a sector where it's going to employ a lot of workers. But right now, of course, this sector is still very much low product, uh, has very low productivity. Um, I think the last time when I researched on this, I think the, the our service sector in China, um, it's about one fifth in terms of productivity compared to the, the so-called frontier countries. So we have a lot of service jobs that are very low tech, low skill, low pay. Um, so I think, you know, with this sort of technological transformation, with this new force, um, I also think that the service sector will be transformed. It will become more high tech um, and it's not necessarily labor saving. Um, so it could be, for example, as we, um, th- if you think about it is we have a, the, we, we have a silver economy. We have this aging population that needs a lot of health professionals. We need a lot of, um, people who, who really have the specialized skills, right, to take care of the elderly. Um, 
I, I don't think that we're going to very soon to adopt, you know, humanoid robots um, to take care of the elderly. And so I think this kinds of jobs, right, that they actually require a lot of skills, a lot of emotional, you know, capital. And so I think those jobs should be considered as high skill and high pay. And we need to make sure that, you know, we'll be able to, you know, provide a skill upgrading and, uh, and upgrade these sectors to make them, you know, better pay, better, um, higher productivity, so to speak. Um, and finally, I think also, um, as we know, the distribution system doesn't necessarily need to completely rely on your productive forces. What do I mean by this? Well, we know that this is the neoclassical myth, right? Where your wages are equal to your vaginal, the so-called value of your marginal uh, productivity of labor, right? But we all know um, in terms of distributed system, it is institutionalized. It's based on, you know, your value system in the economy that based on your policies. So who says that the teachers should get lower pay, right? Than the CEO of a, of a corporation, I, I don't know, in the gambling industry, let's say, right? So I think a lot of these, um, in terms of the distribution system, is value laden and it is policy driven. And so I could see where we have very young, talented students. Um, they would work for, for example, in the high productivity, high value service sector. They don't necessarily work 40 hours a week. Um, and yet they're still getting, you know, a living wage, a wage that really compensate for, you know, their, their skills, their talents, their emotional, uh, devotions and, and also live a, a good life. So, um, at the end of the day, um, I think, you know, I should make it clear that I really support, you know, the schools of thoughts for the modern monetary th theory. And one of the things that they talked about is the, you know, public guarantee jobs, right? That um, their jobs, they're very, very uh, productive and it's very, uh, it has very high social values, but they're not being provided or they're not being provided sufficiently by the private sector. So those are the jobs I think, you know, we, we could guarantee um, and using policy supports, using public money um, to make sure that, you know, we set the standards for the kinds of jobs um, that would be able to really employ, you know, the young and talented and skilled uh, individuals. Look, you mentioned MMT or modern monetary theory, and I think we might bracket that off for another conversation because that is such a big topic in its own right and it touches on so many things. But um, let Certainly. me just go back to to uh, this very interesting dynamic between, I guess, the micro and the macro. The idea of this transformation of the workforce and the upskilling leads potentially to um, access to higher wages for people, and that feeds ultimately into higher take-home pay. Now, again, uh, the macro piece to me, and I'm curious about this, is the relationship that you think or the dynamic that's going to be set, set loose around the connection between new investment in production systems and what that means in terms of the consumption capacity of households? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And I think, you know, to to maybe... Um, to, to maybe think about this in a more... Um, um, how would I put it? Um, to kind of put provide the full story, right? So I think the, the the sort of the concern that comes from this particular topic is this idea that um, if you want to invest, you would have to have savings. If you need the savings, you have to reduce the consumption. So that becomes a trade off, right? So if you want the household to consume more, then the households will save less, and the saving the less savings would then lead to lower investments. So there's this argument about China's imbalance in the sense that you have too much investment and not enough consumption. So I think that is, I think, where the question comes from, right? So somehow there yeah. is a trade-off between consumption and saving, and therefore there's a trade-off between consumption and investment. But again, I think this trade of thought really, in a way, uh, confuses what is saving, where savings comes from, and what creates savings, right? Um, so I think we need to start from the very beginning, which is this idea that, you know, where do we get the investment financing, right? Does saving comes first or does investment come first? Okay. So I know that there are people that, you know, I may not name the names, but, you know, we can fairly attribute to this idea to certain individuals who argue, for example, oh, China's workers getting too much, too, too less income, 
right? The income share is too low, and therefore their saving share is very high. So you have to scratch your 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 your, your head, right? Um, if you go back to the very beginning, the the kings, you know, wrote in in 1936 in the general theory, which laid it out very beautifully and very clearly, right? Where do you get your savings? Well, savings have to come from somewhere. Saving has to come from your income. You have to have the income first before you can save because saving is essentially unspent income. So if for, for people like Professor Michael Patis, right, to say that China's uh, households don't have a lot of income, right, the argument is their income share is too low, that's the reason that they save so much, right? That's the reason why their consumption share is low that just completely makes no sense because if they don't have enough save, uh, if they don't have enough income, how are they able to save? So if their income is really so low, then you should see low consumption, but you also should see low savings, right? So well, you I think this, you know, the, the statistical evidence has consistently been across countries. Sorry to interrupt. Um, that um, that lower house, lower income households actually save a lot less anyway, don't they? I mean, that's actually the the statistical evidence. Um, because exactly. they have to, because low income households have to spend a higher proportion of what incomes they do get on the basic necessities of life. Exactly, exactly. So in macroeconomics, we call this marginal prevents through the save, right? So um, you can try to save as much as you want until you're blue in the face, but if you don't have the income, right, you, you simply can't save. Um, I often use example, you know, uh, for my class, right, when the 60% of American workers are working paycheck to paycheck, how do you expect, you know, many of them have more than $500 in their deposit accounts, right? So going back to this idea, right? So again, to be able to save, you would need to have income. But where does income come from, right? Income comes from jobs, mostly for the working class, right? So you need jobs, but where do you have jobs? Well, that comes from investment. That comes from expansion of, of production capacity, right? So it's not until you start to have the investments, then you generate income, right? And economists will call this multiplying effect. $1 investment generate more than $1 income. And some of this income will be spent and some of the income will be saved. So in a way, from a macro point of view, you need to have the investments to drive income and therefore drive savings, okay? So in this sense, you don't really have a trade-off between investment and consumption because you need investment to have the income in order to spend, right? So I think that, again, it, it's sort of a confusion that somehow if we want to consume, then we, we can invest. In fact, is you need to invest, then you generate the income, then you can consume and you can save. But now, then we need to go back. Issue, isn't there? There's one more issue here, and that is that investment is not just constrained by savings anyway, because investment is, is also is, is a question of credit. And the exactly. creation of credit is not constrained by savings because we're not talking about an intermediation process where banks, for example, perform the role of a warehouse where they literally collect savings from people and then lend them out to others. Banks are actually in the business of creating money. You hit the nail on the head, exactly. Right. So I that's exactly the second dimension of this question, right? Once we understand the causality between investment income and savings, then the next question is if saving is not financed by sorry, if investment is not financed by saving, then what is investment financed by? And that's pretty precisely what you were saying, right? Is the credit. And the credit could be generated in the private sector through banks, right, that have special charters and they have special licenses that can create credit and the bank credit can be traded on par with the public credit, which is the public money, right, which is the state, uh, a sovereign state's monopoly, right, that only the government can say, I can print yuan or I can, you know, uh, create digital yuan and none of you guys can except for the private banks or in China's case, you know, a lot of the state-owned um, uh, banks. So yes, the it commercial is the, banks, it is I guess you'd say, wouldn't you? You'd basically say, look, they're the commercial banks, whether they're publicly or publicly Right. It, it it could be commercial banks. It could be also development banks. Right. In China, yeah. we also have the CDB, which is a super bank that finances a lot yeah. of in infrastructure projects. Um, so yes, it is the bank credit, and sometimes it's through direct government public investment. So that is financed by public money by fiscal spending. Right. So, so yes, so it's, it's the credit that starts 
off the entire process, right? And then the savings simply comes comes at the end as a funding mechanism that validates investment. Um, so that is exactly, I think, the point. Now there is a question about well, what about the share? Does the share make uh, uh, does the share matter, right? So if you have a very high investment share to GDP, when you have a very low consumption share to GDP, could that be a problem? Well, I think again, for the from a consumer point of view, what matters for them is that you have a continuous growth in that consumption. So whether or not they're getting a bigger pie, um, it's it's not as important as households are able to continue to 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 enjoy right the consumer goods and you know in terms of quantity, but also in terms of quality. But there is this sort of question in terms of as you continue to invest and take up a bigger and bigger share of GDP. Um, which means, you know, you you are expanding your productive capacity. Uh, then your consumption share of the GDP is relatively low. Could that become a problem? Well, my sort of um, uh, response to that is, again, it really depends, you know, what the economy really needs at a certain level of development. Um, you could have investment-led growth. You could have consumption-led growth. If you do really want to improve or increase the consumption share of the GDP, then what you need to work on, instead of slowing down income growth, what you need to work on is that proportion of the income that is being saved. So in other words, if you think that, you know, the Chinese saving is too much, the consumption share is too low, then what you wanted to uh, uh, work on maybe is how you can assure the consumers to reduce the precautionary savings, right, and spend more on the discretionary um, aspects. And again, I don't think um, this share is as big of a problem as many you know economists would make it to be because again I, I don't feel that you, if you ask anybody in China right and ask them do you feel like you're deprived of you know consumption or consumer goods um, I know there is an inequality there's definitely you know that China can improve and China is improving um, but in terms of this sort of are, are you feeling that you know now that you have higher and higher investment share and you have a relatively lower consumption share to GDP, do you feel that your consumption level is 20, is, is worse than, you know, 10 years ago, right? I think none of the Chinese would say, you know, their consumption share is lower today and therefore they feel worse off, right, than say 10 years ago when the consumption share to GDP is higher. So I think it's important to kind of, you know, make the distinction, but also knowing if you do want to raise that consumption share to GDP, you know, what would be the approach to do that? Right. So this idea we need to somehow, you know, curtail investment in order to increase consumption share to GDP. I think that's really nonsensical argument. Um, it, it simply cannot be done and it won't generate desirable outcome either. So perhaps the other thing to mention here is actually the experience. And I think that there are two two parts to this um, picture. One is that the economic growth that has taken place say, over the last 15 years in China has accompanied a real growth in household disposable income by something like 300%. So house that so the pie itself for a household has grown. Um, at the same time, a household, so this is the aggregate situation, so on average, if you will, has uh, the, the household aggregate savings of the proportion of disposable income has fallen marginally from, what, about 43% to about 39 now, I'm plucking those numbers out of my head now, so my memory on those isn't too precise, but something like that. But when you look at it in real terms, in absolute num number terms, we're looking at a very significant amount of additional household consumption capacity, as well as, as well as, not instead of, but as well as a significant growth in pooled household savings, even though the proportion of household savings has declined modestly. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think the household savings uh, in terms of share, uh, also, you know, the counterpart, the consumption share, I think um, it it has got undergone a long period of the, sort of the, the trend is sort of declining savings to GDP ratio or to income ratio and then increasing consumption. But I think COVID did make a little sort of um, break, right? But because yeah. during COVID, you simply can't consume uh, when you're, you know, uh, hunkered down at home and you're saving, you know, in a way that's increased. And when we look at the bank deposits, for example, um, that basically surged during COVID years. And so, um, but, you know, it's unlikely this, this, this sort of the, the, 
this uh, break is going to continue as a trend. Um, I, I think that it's unlikely uh, in terms of, you know, just looking at the trend going, going um, since basically yeah. 2000s, I think. Um, um, but again, I, I think um, also in a way, uh, I, I totally agree with you. I think we're seeing very rapid income growth in terms of disposable income, and it's more than GDP growth. As a matter of fact, I think in the most recent years, um, and we're also seeing, yes, that the, the, the savings um, has been, uh, you know, trending down, but then recently grow, um, you know, part of, I think, COVID shock. And so I think it remains to be seen how how quickly, right, that, that would, again, go back to the previous trend, sort of revert back to the pre-COVID uh, trajectory. Um, but again, I, I also think that there's a lot of... Um, uh, I think it's still debatable how important it is to to see the kinds of the change in the shares in terms of you know consumption and and, and savings, um, because again to me um, you know w- when you think about China's consumption, there's also a lot of uh, public consumption. Like in a way, so you go to a you, you go to in China in certain you know museums and so on and so forth, right? You don't pay anything, right? Like in the U.S., you go to a museum, it costs quite heftily. Right, it, it can cost you quite a bit of money, but in China, many of these consumptions are heavily subsidized. So I think that is another way to to think about it. Um, it instead of saying that, you know, if the consumption to GDP share is low, it simply means people really consume less um, compared to their GDP growth. And one of the things, of course, is you know you do have income growth that is, you know, high, but investment growth is also very high. So that could generate a smaller share of the consumption GDP. Uh, but again, so much consumption is publicly subsidized. So, um, you know, a lot of the subsidized meals in China, a lot of subsidized, you know, entertainment and uh, cultural experiences and so, so on and so forth, education, um, you name it. So I, I think it's sometimes hard to kind of pinpoint, uh, you know, exactly how much we really want that so-called consumption to GDP share to grow. And I know that there are people who, for example, talked about, you know, China accounts for 30 percent of the global manufacturing, but they only account for about 13 percent of global consumption. Um, but again, I, I think some of the data, some of these sort of indicators are not really, really comparable and it's not very meaningful. Yeah, so the, the, the problem's partly a horses for horses comparison, isn't it? The, um, the, the issue around where the consumption takes place, I guess, is the misleading piece for a lot of people. They think that consumption only um, is something that households do. And I wanted to touch on a couple of things. One is actually the role that enterprises continue to play in terms of their own um, consumption of resources as opposed to consumption of final goods, um, number one. But also, um, as we've had this discussion, what brings to mind is the application of new productive forces in the production system itself through the mechanisms of digitalization, if you will, are also affecting the efficiency of circulation. So we've gone from the productivity of making stuff um, to now thinking about the velocity at which the circulation system moves value through this system. Um, perhaps you could uh, give us some of your thoughts on on those aspects. Yeah, I, I think um, that's an important point, but I think we didn't really touch up on the specific technologies in the production sort of sphere. But yeah, digitalization definitely it really helped to streamline and optimize production. But you are right, in the circulation aspect, and we... Uh, the data, I mean, really uh, show, right, for example, the online retail sales, um, that consistent growth more than double the overall retail sale growth. I think last year or this first quarter, um, you know, the retail sales growth uh, was about 5.5%, but online sales is way more than, you know, double digits growth. So, yes, I think this kinds of digitization of the economy uh, is really uh, both increased consumption but also, you know, increase the efficiency of circulation, right? And so I think that is definitely helpful. And not to mention, you know, digital payments. I know that you, um, you know, you're an expert on blockchain and, you know, digital payment technologies. And so I think that also it's, it's very important um, because that really also helps to economize on transaction costs. It also, you know, in many different ways, it helps the circulation much more efficient. And it could also make, you know, monetary policy making a lot more targeted, um, I would say. Um, so yeah, I do think that digitalization is not really only rep- important for production, but also for circulation and for also for you know consumption. 
So, um, you know, it, it's really where I talked about the second dimension, which is, you know, how you integrate these technologies into various aspects in the economy. And that really helped to, you know, propel that productivity growth. It makes me think of this question around just the productivity of capital generally, you know, not only when it's applied to the production systems themselves, which touches on the total factor productivity questions we started this conversation on, but also the volume of capital or credit that's required to function as working capital within a circulation system. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's a very interesting question. Um, the way I think the TFP is calculated, you know, it's basically that's a residual, right? So you look at how much DP you grow, and then you look at how much growth of resources that you used, um, be it, you know, capital or labor, then whatever that is left over is captured by this TFP. So in a sense, I think if you uh, would want to sort of argue, for example, you're still putting the same amount of machinery, you're still putting a map the same amount of credit that helped to finance the purchase and the acquisition of these machineries, but you are able to do it in a way that it's more efficient, right? That it's not dependent on the size of the capital that you, that you put in the, the production, but you're making the utilization of that capital a lot more efficient and make the finance that go through a lot better. And in a way you also improve your allocation of your capital, then I think that will then fit into this TFP. So it's, it's again, this is a catch all uh, measure of how much you're able to improve your, um, your, 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 um, your productivity, right? Um, so I think one concrete example maybe is um, if you say, um, Say you wanted to build a factory or you wanted to adopt a new um, uh, machine tool. And in the past, it takes 10 days for you to go through all the hurdles to get your finance to be able to purchase this machine tools. And, um, you know, that would take 10 days, right? But now if you're able to do it much faster, right? A click away, uh, you get this digital profiles, you can see exactly your credit history, the money could be sent to your account, while to your account you know, in no time, and you really, you know, accelerate the process, you're still putting in the same amount of capital, but you're able to generate the production much faster, your net present value of your investment much better, much higher, um, then I do think that will be captured, right, by the TFP. So I think, yes, I, I do think that the, the sort of digitalization, um, not only in the production process, unfortunately, I use the example still in the production process, but um, but you can see how this could also apply to the circulation, right? Somehow you're able to get your products um, sold uh, much faster, right? Then giving the same exact input, um, you, are, you become more streamlined and you definitely improve your efficiency. Yeah, and look, some of the ways that I've thought about it is that because a production system is to enable you to produce something and sell it and keep doing that over and over again, one of the challenges that you've got is the time period between when you need to finance the the units of production itself, the things that go into making stuff, and then, you know, what happens at the other end when you finally get your income. And that time period um, is financed you, either off your own um, savings as a, as a company um, or more mm -hmm. likely if you're in growth phase um, through, um, through working capital that is financed from borrowing. Now, if you can reduce the overall time involved from point A to point B, uh, then the amount of capital that is in effect sitting idle, um, either as inventory or as, um, or as, um, in inactive money, um, you, you, you don't need as much. And when you don't need as much, you're paying lower interest, right? Um, so your cost of production, when you take into account cost of finance drops dramatically. Yeah, I think from a individual capital, uh, for individual businesses point of view, I think that it's definitely true. Um, when you think about it, it, it exact the broader sort of the credit system. Um, well, yes, I, I agree. I think, you know, if you can short term the time that you need to use your working capital, right, that you need to pay for the credit that you're using, then it's definitely, you know, it definitely helped with the business bottom line. Um, that's, that's no doubt. Yeah. Yeah, look, it's, it, I mean, for me, a lot of these issues, which I think often makes it very difficult to think about is not only are we looking at understanding the ratios of things at any moment in time, 
but we're also trying to understand how they work dynamically through time. And and maybe sometimes the the mental bandwidth, if you will, struggles mm-hmm. with all of those dimensions. But I think that's the challenge now to understand new quality productive forces is to actually see it in all of these dimensions. The last bit that I wanted to touch on with you today really goes to um, the impact on the green economy space. And, you know, we talked about the EVs and, and how that is transforming transportation in a sense. But I wanted to maybe pick your brains a little bit on a more fundamental issue, which is a change to potential change to the structure of energy costs over time. So upfront capital investments in renewable energy technologies with very, very low um, operating expenses to harvest the energy versus the more traditional um, hydrocarbon-based systems, which have both high capital costs and also high operating costs, and what the implications of that change in the structure of energy costs is likely to be for economies generally. Yeah. Um, so I think one of the things that I think, uh, you know, for the renewable energy is, you're right, it, the, the upfront costs in terms of, you know, the capital expenditure and also the R&Ds and also the basic infrastructures where you need to have those, you know, high voltage um, grid and all of those investments would be costly, right, at the upfront. Um, but, you know, over time, when you start to build that production capacity, when you achieve the scale economy, um, then that cost would be, you know, much, much more effective. It was much, much lower. And compared to the traditional uh, fossil fuels and, and all of this, it I think it would become harder and harder because, you know, you always get the low-hanging fruit, right, where you can drill the ease, the, the easily, the most easy, um, the, the easiest place, right? You would already got those first. And so progressively, it's going to take more and more for you to be able to generate the same kind of energy output. So I do think that in China, um, now we are achieving so much efficiency in terms of the manufacturing and also um, in terms of the uh, the generation of, of these renewable energies, right? So now I think what companies and the governments are working on is really on the deployment of the energies. So we still have this sort of, a lot of renewable energies are generated in the West, co- uh, in the West side of the country, in the hinterlands and then you need to ship those energies from you know the west or transmit the energies um, from the west to the east. So you you need all these you know um, the high voltage uh, you know uh, power line to be able to do that. Um, and there's also you know the question about you know can we generate even more by utilizing creative ways to you know put all this you know the the solar panels on the rooftops. And I know there's so many initiatives that are doing it, and there's so many in, in innovative ways and you know, allow the rural residents to uh, rent their roof space, right? And they will be able to generate the electricity and they can use it and they can also, you know, uh, put it back the assets and, and generate money out of it. So I think there's a huge potential going forward. And I think you're totally right. That is part of, you know, where the long-term investment is going to generate long-term benefits over time. But even now, you know, with the current investment, you know, China invests $890 billion dollars last year uh, on green investment, generally defined, not just the power generation, but also even EVs and other green industries. But that $890 billion created $1.6 trillion to the GDP, um, according to the report in you know, Financial Times, uh, Bloomberg. Um, so even when you just think about the short term, right, investment generates a lot of outcome, a lot of you know, economic growth, uh, not to mention that productivity you know, spurred. And that continue would help to generate low cost energies and, you know, again, feed back to your, your growth and productivity. So I think that is beautiful. Um, I think, a, 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 you know, a, a, a motor or a, a brandy, right, that China is going to continue to, to do this, right, to, 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 you know, transition to the green economy and continuously to, you know, reap the benefits of, you know, the low energy cost, the more sustainable kinds of um, energy uh, uses and, and so on and so forth. Um, so for a lot of, I think, again, the Western, um, and also I think, you know, some of the, I was a genuine concern that on the one hand, China is developing green energies, but on the other hand, China is also building a lot of these 
co power fire uh co co power um um uh, co fire power plants. Um, I think you know again a lot of these is really just as a backup. Um, that there is the concern about you know energy shortage. There is a concern about energy uh, sovereignty and and security. So I think a lot of these are as backup, and I don't necessarily think that you know China is going to anytime sort of revert back right to let's use the you know coal power pipeline because it's cheaper. Um, I I don't think that's necessarily the case. And again, for people who worried about oh, is this the political capture? Is it that the coal industry is simply just having too much political power? Um, for those kind of arguments, again, I think you know when you look at the numbers, right, that the, the tremendous growth in investment. It's in the green sector. It's not in you know the old traditional fossil fuel industries. Um, so I yep. think you know, yeah. Hey, one one last question. You actually provoked this thought in my head when you were describing the situation, particularly in the geography of energy production and energy consumption. Uh, the other dimension of this is actually the establishment of major data centers in the west of China, um, closer to the energy sources, and perhaps. The um, and maybe this is something we touch on in a future conversation, but the 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 data center infrastructure is actually pivotal to the new productive forces being available in a widespread way. Um, so it, it 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 it's the intersection point, if you will, between green energy um, and the new productive forces from a digitalization perspective, and also shows the geography of economic development quite nicely. Right, exactly. I think this is a whole package, right?、Um, so yes, of course, the data is so important, and data centers are so energy、uh, intensive. So it makes sense to build,、um, you know, these data centers in the more sort of western and the more sort of hinterland where you have a lot of energies,、uh, a very low cost in terms of the land uses and so on and so forth. And I think that also, in a way, helped to develop, right, part of the,、um, you know, the the part of this the In terms of areas, right, they're still relatively underdeveloped.、Um, but of course, there's also the data that are, you know, going to be transferred to the east side、um, to support the, you know, the more vibrant sort of uses of the data. And I kind of mentioned this in my piece, but、um, you know, now the new buzzwords is that data is new gold, right? So、um, it's not just new energy, but data is so important、um, in terms of a very essential ingredient in this new productive. A、uh, new quality productive force, and so definitely, I think you know, in a way, China is advantageous in terms of、um, you know, there's so much so much uses of data, there's so much generation of data, right? Giving it's a such large country, and so on and so forth.、Um, so I think you know, data is essential. That's probably one of the important、uh, you know, sort of the the、uh, deciding force, right? In terms of AI and all this,、um, you know. So I think that is very important, and I think you know, China has been working on、um, you know how to really. In a way, standardize and regulate and promote the use of the data.、Um, so, in terms of, for example, AI, you know, there are three important、um, regulations that have been put forth. You know, from 2021, 2022, 2023.、Uh, in a way, trying to, you know, make the uses of data and the sort of output model as well to be more truthful and and accurate, and also respect privacy and sovereignty and sort of security. So I think all these are are very important, and I think that goes to the you know third part, which is you know how do we make sure that we establish these sort of new institutions、um, that are adaptive to the new reality, right? The new kind of productive input that we need to collect, we need to process, we need to protect, we need to distribute, and we need to you know commercialize and use. And so I think that is entire sort of a, a package, you know, a holistic sort of growth model that you know consider the process. The, the the geographic di- distribution, right, and the, the new regulatory framework. So all of these are, I think,、um, are really tied together. Yeah, look, it's a monstrous undertaking in such a big country,、um, and I think as a as an unfolding economic and social work in progress, it's、uh, it's quite a remarkable thing to watch. We've covered a lot of territory already today, and of course, it leaves a lot of extra questions to ask, but we won't have time for that today. Are there any final thoughts from you in terms of The topic of the new quality productive forces that we probably didn't touch on that you would just like to at least flag for the viewers. Yeah, I think what probably yes, we have covered a lot of grounds, and、um, you know,、uh, some are more core to this question, and some are more sort of marginal but definitely related. I think one of the things that we probably didn't touch a lot on, and I know this is you know really your 
wheelhouse, this is really your forte, which is the geopolitical implications of this, right? So as China promote the, the, the promote the new quality productive force, you know, what are the sort of political implications of that, right? Are there any sort of um, pushbacks? What are the kind of barriers, right? Um, thinking about all those protectionism kind of policies that trying to cut China off uh, advanced technologies, right? Does that slow China down? Does that actually, you know, uh, spur China to forge ahead? Um, and also, you know, with the new quality productive force, where China finds itself in the global landscape. So I think we kind of left out those conversations. But like you said, I think these are really broader questions that maybe for another time, um, maybe we could have, you know, other guests that we could, you know, sort of have some more brainstorming. And I think that would be very important question to to tackle with. Yeah. Yeah, look, fantastic. Look, once again, thanks for your time today and your wisdom and your knowledge. I'm sure well, that everybody who watches will have learned a lot. Um, I did, and um, and I look forward to having you back on talking about both money and monetary theory, as well as uh, the geopolitical implications of this new era of um, of digitalization and productivity. So thanks again. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I really enjoyed it. The conversation is fabulous. I really also learned a lot from this process and clear my mind. And yeah, I look forward to uh, future collaborations.